Jeff is the CEO of the newly launched Sonoma Clean Power, and um, we're thrilled to have him. And thank you, Jeff. Test, test. Can you hear me? Good morning. Um, I have a hard time with podium, so uh, thank you for inviting us here. Uh, I think this is a really um, timely forum. I think this topic of CCA is uh, is exciting because of what's happening. Joe laid out the opportunities because of the power market. Uh, there are opportunities legislatively too. There was an attempt by PG&E and their union recently to try and block uh, certain aspects of, of community choice from happening. Uh, that was recently defeated, and so I think there was um, there, there's a renewed interest in this, and, and perhaps even one of the reasons why you're here. We get a lot of phone calls about potentially joining our program, and one of the things, since we're so new, we've only been serving customers for four months, uh, is that we're really supportive of other efforts to start new programs while we're uh, getting launched, and so Business for Clean Energy, I think, is a terrific way of getting out information about how to do it the easy way, Marin's here today, I see Jamie. Um, Marin blazed the trail. They, they were the first uh, community choice program out of the gate. And really, uh, they had to deal with all kinds of challenges that we didn't have to because they figured out a lot of solutions because they went through the regulatory process, because they went through the marketing efforts and learned a lot. And uh, what I wanna do is make sure that you get the lessons that they learned and that we learned so that you can take half as much time as we did and spend half as much money as we did launching. That's the goal. So I think <laughs> no more three-year process, no more multi-million dollar studies. Uh, let's get, simplify this, right? Because if it, this is not actually that complicated. And so um, what I wanna do at one o'clock is tell you about the lessons we've learned uh, in specific. I wanna give you a lot of concrete tools that you can take back. And I think what I wanna talk about here uh, this morning is really what's happening with Sonoma Clean Power. I'll give you a little bit of the picture of that. And then I also want to convey an idea that a community choice program in some ways is less about electricity and greenhouse gas than it is about local control and what determination we have about taking opportunities for adapting to emerging conditions. And what I mean by that is a community choice program means you have control over a whole lot of finances, a whole lot of income, over contacting customers. You have control over information. You have control over the future of expenses in your region to some degree. And what that means is as the world changes, as the cost of storage changes, as electric vehicles change, as we have new rules around net metering, you know, as we have all of these kinds of emerging conditions, you get to decide how to adapt to it and how fast. I believe that is the single biggest potent power <laughs> that community choice has, is that you get to decide, and if you wanna do something in 30 days instead of three years, you get to do it. So I think that's what's exciting to me, and to put some just really specific examples on this, uh, we're only the second community choice program to be up and running. Uh, when we did our feasibility study uh, a couple years ago, uh, that feasibility study estimated our prices would be around 5% over PG&E, that we'd only be able to beat greenhouse gas emissions by a small amount. And uh, really, it was really quite wrong because the, the way a feasibility study done, is done is it's driven by political forces. And in our county, the political forces wanted to be very conservative so that we didn't accidentally overhype anything. And as a result, it came up with a very wrong answer. Our rates are 5% below PG&E's, uh, and our greenhouse gas emissions are 34% lower than PG&E's. And so what that means is feasibility studies uh, aren't that useful unless they use real data. And the only way to have real data is to get a bid. So one of the, so I'm gonna talk about specific techniques at one o'clock, but a sneak preview of one technique is do a very quick and dirty feasibility study if you have to for political reasons. Keep it really inexpensive, move it really quickly, and then recognize that the real value is get a JPA together, get a real bid, and that is your feasibility study. And it turns out getting to that point in the process could cost less than doing a feasibility study. And it could take far less time if you have the political alignment. So 
Sonoma Clean Power, as an example, uh, we, we started serving customers on May 1 of this year. Um, six weeks into the process, we hit cash flow break even. Uh, two months into the process, we had earned enough money to have a net position better than zero. We had earned, earned and retained enough cash that we had more cash than we had debt. That was $7 million of net position in two months. We are a very small county. We are 500,000 people, and we're not even serving the whole county. We were serving 23,000 customers, mostly commercial, and we got to that point. I say this because there is a lot of fat in the power industry. Right now, there is so much margin that we're still paying 15% of all of our income to PG&E to make sure they don't lose any profit and their other customers don't have to subsidize our customers for out-of-market contracts. And uh, we still have that kind of room. And as Joe alluded, that kind of room may not last forever. Uh, it's good to capitalize on it while we have it. I do believe there's room at least for three to four years that's in a similar kind of uh, vein to that. Because when we look at forward price curves, uh, we look like we can procure power at those kind of margins for at least several years. What happens after that is anyone's guess. Um, but I wanted to convey that because I wanted to give you a sense of that opportunity. That income can be put to use. So one of the things that we're looking at very seriously is um, not just getting new renewables installed statewide, but also looking inside our own county. Uh, we have remained very, uh, how should I call it, anti-policy based, meaning we avoid buying nuclear power, but we have no policy against it. Uh, we are focused on building renewables inside our county, but we just did a deal for 30 megawatts outside of our county because it was a really good price. And I would encourage, as one of the strategies that you all think about, is don't overplan, and also think about those kind of uh, intentions and uh, movements that you want to make as arrows in this direction. I want to reduce my fossil contracts, for example. We have a mission to reduce greenhouse gas, uh, gases, but Community Choice does not have to do that by law. The only thing Community Choice was really originally established to do was provide competition in the marketplace. And it's up to each region to decide how to use that. Um, in Sonoma County and in Marin as well, there's an interest in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and that's a key part of it. Um, but it's up to you, and that's another part of the local control, is that you get to call how hard you push on greenhouse gas versus rates. There are CCAs in other states that um, don't focus on greenhouse gas at all. Uh, they're really just focused on rates. Um, I think, uh, let, let me give you some other specifics. So um, we just uh, were, again, six weeks into our, our serving customers. Uh, there's an interesting kind of credit that a community choice program has or any load serving entity. Uh, it's similar to a water agency in the sense that you have essential services credit. And to a bond underwriter, that's very interesting. It means that what you provide is considered something so essential that people generally pay their bills. In fact, about 99.7% of the public eventually pays their power bill in California. That's a pretty good collection rate. If you go to any other loan officer for any other product, they'd be very jealous of that. And as a result, it's bankable which means six months into serving customers with virtually no cash on hand and no credit rating, uh, we were able to sign a deal for a, call it a 70, $80 million solar project, new construction, um, just on the faith that this has a good credit expected. Um, that's interesting. It's interesting because we didn't actually know those details going in. That was an emerging opportunity that banks came to us and said, you know, we'd really like to work with you because you have this special kind of credit. Um, we have the ability to, to issue bonds as well, and I would encourage any JPA that's forming to make sure that that is an option in your JPA. I doubt we'll do it for the first two or three years because that really is the kind of thing you'd want to do once you have more financial uh, capacity. Uh, we have under contract today 10 megawatts of geothermal as well as that 30 megawatts of, of new solar. Uh, that contract through Calpine is local to us. It's, it's uh, produced inside Sonoma County, and it grows to 18 megawatts. Um, if you think about baseload resources, uh, a megawatt of baseload serves about as much power as three megawatts of salt. 
because it's running all the time, 24-7, and solar is intermittent. And what's interesting about that is uh, we've got a local uh, contract that we were able to negotiate. Um, but importantly, we're starting to look at taking control of our load shape. And there's two sides to that. One is our supply. So we're buying base load for some of our sources. We're buying peaking power for some of our sources. Putting those together starts to look like a load supply. If we add a little bit of storage onto that, so we get the 7 p.m. peak that's starting to emerge in California and as it becomes stronger and stronger over the next few years as solar comes on. Uh, has anybody heard of the duck chart or the duck of doom? <laughs> Our, our load shape in California, uh, I guess this is, was invented by the same person who in, named constellations because it's a little bit of a stretch, but uh, the, load, the load shape basically goes up throughout the day but then goes down in the middle of the day because there's so much solar coming online that it's actually going to eat into peak. Peak is no longer going to be at noon or 2 or 3 or even 4 p.m. It's going to start going up at 5 and it's going to really skyrocket at 7 p.m. That's interesting. It's a problem. Nobody has an answer for it yet, but lots of people are betting on storage. And so it'll be fun to try and solve that problem, and CCA is one tool we can use because we have the ability to, to look at the supply side, but we also have the ability to look at the demand side. And we can do it in a serious way. Community choice should be organized so that if its income declines, proportional with expenses, we should celebrate that. We should actually set up community choice so that if customers are buying less energy, we claim victory. So we're serving the public. So that's unusual. If you're a for-profit company, you're trying to do both. You're trying to get your incentives to, to uh, comply with those kind of energy efficiency programs, but you're also trying to make sure they don't actually deliver results. That's <laughs> called split incentives. And I worked managing energy efficiency programs for IOUs for years as an outside consultant, and I will tell you, it is a sham. Uh, programs do not deliver results. By and large, if you look at the bottom line of what happened as a result of a program, very few programs actually deliver even measurable results at all. And that's a problem. So CCA can really take a stab at that. We can go out to customers and rethink the way we're approaching programs altogether. Uh, let's not talk about giveaway programs or, or you know, the, the kinds of financing that utilities have done in the past. Let's get really creative and think more like a startup thinks and get into the heads of customers and make sure it's not complicated. Nobody wants 50 choices for retrofitting their air conditioner. They want somebody to tell them, here's something that works and it works every time and we stand by it. Here's your one solution. Uh, Simplify, simplify, simplify. So we, we also have gotten started with a few other things, and I'll wrap up soon since I got the time card. Um, we've uh, gotten a net metering program going for solar customers, and that's important because one thing we solved with that was this problem where everybody putting solar on their rooftops of a home or a small business would size it so it only met 80% of their load. So they didn't want to accidentally make extra. That's a problem. Why can't we have people serving all of their loads? So what we did is we said, well, if you accidentally make extra, we'll pay you retail for that entire portion. And that's important because now you get a check for at least the generation retail price, which is significant for a residential customer, about 23 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, that's a lot more than what pg &E would pay, which is around four to five cents a kilowatt hour because they're paying the wholesale rate. And so that is a safety valve. If you want to install solar to build 100%, do it. Uh, the other thing, and that required virtually no subsidy on our part, because we can resell that power to another residential customer for virtually the same rate. So almost a pass-through, very small subsidy. In a $200 million steady state program, you probably have $200,000 subsidizing that program. So very reasonable way to encourage that industry. We also have a program we call ProFit. It's a pun on a feed-in tariff, uh, or profit if you read it. Um, and the idea is to sell us wholesale power. So uh, people with warehouses, people with land or parking lots can sell us wholesale power. One thing that we've done to try and improve on practices in the past is set our base rate for that at a level where it adjusts after five years downward in a standard contract. The important thing is private sector cares most about the first five years. 
That's where they want to get their return. That's where they get all their accelerated depreciation. That's what the bank is looking at. So we pay a lot more in the first five years, and then it resets downward to a level that we're happy with so that we're not burdened for 20 or 25 years with some out-of-market contract. Those are a few of the kinds of tools I want to share, um, and then I'll, uh, I'll give you more at 1 o'clock, but it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much.